Minister. Uh, last con -cooler, or con -cooler. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I beg to move that the House Amendment Bill, um, Northern Ireland 2020, do now pass. Uh, I welcome this further opportunity to speak about this bill and why it's important for the future of our social and affordable housing programmes. Before I speak in the bill generally, I'd like to address a couple of issues that were raised in previous debates. Thank you, the Minister. Could I just outline here for members the timetable for this bill uh, and to inform the Minister that uh, this, as the final stage has been moved, the, the Business Committee have agreed that there will be no time limit on this debate. Uh, therefore, I'm going to call upon the Minister to continue. So there will be no limit on the time for speeches as it is primary legislation. There are six speakers down so far. Uh, and uh, unless, hopefully, it will not last too long, uh, Minister. Thanks very much for that clarification. Um, and <clears throat> it was almost an invitation to add the list and people talk as long as I want. I want to assure people I just want to cover the issues that are pertinent to this bill, but certainly provide some clarification on issues that were raised in the last debate, because I think it's important people get that. So as I was saying, members concerned, we raised some, some concern, as I did myself, about the very late publication of the consultation report on the two consultations on the reclassification issue. I said during the consideration stage debate that I would establish what happened, and I, I have done so. I have written to the Chair of the Communities Committee to provide an explanation, which I will share um, here. Minister Hargey considered the report alongside the draft bill and re related materials. She approved the report for publication on the 18th of March. Officials were advised of this on the 6th of April during the period when, with, when limited IT uh, equipment uh, that was rapidly making decisions and adjustments to remote working. At that point, the report should have been prepared for publication, but due to an oversight, this, not, this was not done. This was discovered on the 1st of June, at which time the officials took action. The report was issued to the committee on the 4th of June and published on the, de on the department's website and sent to all MLAs on the 12th of June. The officials in question have accepted full responsibility for this oversight. They have apologised to me and have asked uh, that that apology is also extended to the committee, and I want to apologise to the Assembly. The second issue I want to address is what appears to be a misunderstanding of the role of ONS. Some members refer to ONS as having rejected the amendments. I can confirm that this is not the role of ONS. The decision as to what is included in the bill or not is for the Minister, the Executive and indeed this Assembly. ONS will simply review the reclassification decision once the legislation receives royal assent. When I spoke about the possibility of legal challenge, that was not about the, the ONS, but just to be clear, it was about the risk that the member for FOIL, Mark Durkin, had raised in his proposed amendments um, represented in, in the bill. I believe that inclusion in this particular bill of provisions that would abolish the housing executive sales scheme would cause a legislative competence problem. This is because taking away the right that the housing executive tenants currently have that of purchasing their homes potentially engages Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the right to property. In a process that has been driven by the press and need for housing association reclassification, the abolition of the housing executive sales scheme would interfere with this right without any clear reason. A provision of an assembly bill which is incompatible with ECHR rights is not law, so the removal of the right to buy may be considered by a court not to have been effective. The only supposed basis for abolishing the housing executive sales scheme as part of this bill was to prevent a challenge arising from the difference in the right to buy. Those who rent from the housing executive can buy, and those who rent from a housing association will not be able to. But no such challenge could be successful because the reason for taking away the right to buy from housing association tenants simply does not exist for housing executive tenants. Removing 
removing the right for housing association, association tenants is clear um, and, and it is also integral, an integral argument to achieving reclassification by ONS and they require the abolition of the housing association's sales scheme. A court is likely to consider that abolishing the housing executive's sales schemes through this bill unjustifiably interferes with the rights of housing executive tenants. There are good grounds to consider abolition of the right to buy of housing executive tenants, but, the, um, but that needs its own policy justification and simply cannot exist in a bill which addresses a specific problem, the reclassification of housing associations. Every bill, once it's passed its final stage and before it proceeds to royal assent, first passes to the Attorney General for him to consider whether it is within the competence of the Assembly as defined under Section 6 of the NI Act. Should the Attorney consider that the competence of the Assembly is in question, then before the bill proceeds to royal assent, the Attorney may refer the bill to the UK Supreme Court for a determination. In our current circumstances, this outcome would present a significant and costly delay to this bill. If we bring forward, as I and my predecessor have committed to do, proposals with a different and broader objective, for example, as part of a different bill and a process that was considering how to maximise the supply of social housing, then the courts would be more likely to consider abolition of the housing executive sales scheme as justified in the public interest and hence more likely to fit within the competence. We should address the, the inequity between the housing executive and housing association tenants. It is an issue on which the department has been very transparent in the four years developing this legislation. The department's consultations on the bill explored this point exhaustively. They give particular consideration to the issue of the housing executive sales scheme for this very reason. This has supported what I believe is a correct conclusion. Achieve reclassification safely and securely in, in the first instance through this bill and then address the housing executive's sales scheme afterwards. I and my predecessor, Georgie Harkey, have committed to do this with all urgency. But when my department brings forward proposals for that scheme, it will be considered properly in its own right and not as an add-on to a bill proceeding under accelerated passage. I would remind the House of why we need this legislation and why we've worked at speed to put this legislation in place. ONS determined in 2016 that housing associations should be classified to the public sector because they observed a level of control of housing associations by the executive through my department. This is why the sole focus of the bill is to remove or amend those provisions in current housing legislation that provide for this control. The bill will replace current consents process for a number of functions carried out by housing associations with a notifications process also. It will more clearly frame the circumstances in which housing regulator may launch an inquiry into the activities of a housing association and provides, these, uh, provides that these must be based in failure or suspected failure to comply with legislation. The bill removes the power of the department to petition for the winding up of an association, a power that was never used. Creditor bodies still can use this. Finally, the bill proposes to end the statutory house sales schemes for housing associations and introduces a power to enable the department to support a, a voluntary house sales scheme. I would also remind members and particularly I would like to reassure tenants that the bill will not see a decrease in the regulatory authority exercised by the housing regulator. It does not diminish the relationship between the tenant and association nor the tenant's ability to engage with the regulator. The approach to the legislation has been based on the direction from the executive in September 2016 and does only that which is necessary to achieve reversal of the ONS decision. The ONS's reclassification decision put at risk the financial arrangements we have, to, we have to allow our registered housing associations to provide homes for our most vulnerable and to operate the Affordable Homes Programme 
which provides a route into affordable home ownership for many. Passing this legislation will protect those programmes and ensure that the Social Housing Development Programme and the Co-Ownership Programme can continue in the future. And just last week, I announced £10 million investment from my department to enable the co-ownership scheme to open up again to new customers following a pause in applications since March due to COVID-19. Well, I'm glad to be able to support the co-ownership scheme, it is worth remembering that this £10 million in itself is the equivalent to the cost of 150 social homes. It's a far better outcome for the public purse and for those people who are desperately in need of social housing that this money comes via FTC, Financial Transactions Capital, which will be able to do so as a result of this bill. I am committed to do more to deliver for those who are in real need, and this bill means that we're levering in all the financial resources that we possibly can to make homes available to those in need. These programmes being maintained and hopefully expanded will also help our construction industry. I think that all members will agree with me that having a strong construction sector will support, help support the economic recovery as we move into the recovery phase of dealing with this horrible pandemic. In the last debate we had in this bill, we discussed the revenue generated by the house sales schemes in the past and what it has done with the money raised. Capital receipts from housing association sales continue to the funding which is used to deliver the social housing development programme. It must be reinvested in the provision of new social housing within two years, though associations can also use some of the capital generated to cover fees such as solicitor's costs and valuation fees. The housing executives available records indicate that 104 million generated by housing association sales, of which 89 million has been reinvested in new builds. The position is different for the housing executive. Receipts from its house sale schemes are returned to the department each year for consideration in the context of funding in the wider uh, Department for Communities budget. Receipts from housing executive house sales since 2008 and 2009 have been in the region of 170 million. The level of receipts that the housing executive through uh, the department's capital grant uh, can retain each year is determined by the department with the balance used to fund other departmental priorities. Any receipts the housing executive may retain through capital grant are used by its landlord services to fund in part along with its own rental income improvements in its own stock and it's not used in financing new build programmes. And as I have said previously, there is a huge need for investment in housing executive stock of we are to ensure that its homes are fit for the future. That is a much wider problem and I'm sure we will return to it in a later at a future stage. I would like to acknowledge the many stakeholders that have been involved in this bill. It is right that I offer my thanks for all their contributions and also thank the Communities Committee for their support in getting this bill through by accelerated passage. And finally, I'd like to thank those in the department, both in the Department for Communities and indeed uh, for those here in the Assembly and the various legal teams who have worked on the bill and enabled to get it at this stage. I hope all parties can give this bill their full support. I commend the bill to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'm now calling upon Kelly Armstrong, who is the Deputy Chair of the Committee for Communities. Ms. Armstrong. Thank you very much, Temporary Speaker. Um, it's not very often I get this box in front of me. Um, I just wish well our Chair, who's not able to be here today um, due to a health issue, um, but she'll be back the next time she'll have this back. But I'd just like to um, thank the Minister very much for coming forward um, and getting this to this stage. It's almost four years since the Office of National Statistics, ONS, took the decision to reclassify registered housing associations to the public sector and designate them as a public non-financial corporations. During that period, we have relied upon derogation after derogation from the Treasury to ensure that the impact of this technical issue is minimised, but that derogation runs out next March. I am therefore glad that we have reached the final stage of a bill that provides the housing association sector with some certainty. The bill itself was relatively straightforward, but the road to the final stage was not quite so straight. My colleague on committee, Mark Durgan, um, presented a number of amendments. Um, which were considered very sympathetically by members, but 
did not get the same level of support when it came to the vote. It is understandable that the omission of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive's House Sales Scheme should be questioned when the Housing Association's Right to Buy Scheme is included. But again, in a narrowly scoped bill, it is the Right to Buy Scheme of Housing Associations that is of key importance. The status of the Housing Executive or its House Sales Scheme are not matters of concern for ONS, as has been highlighted by the Minister. The commitment given by the Minister to quickly bring forward proposals on the future of the Housing Executive's House Sales Scheme is accepted by the Committee. Indeed, this will likely form part of a much wider and detailed consideration of the reform or revitalisation of the Housing Executive, and the Committee looks forward to engaging with the Minister on this issue in the autumn time. Um, as the Minister has highlighted during discussions um, on amendments, it was made clear that the Committee was not in receipt of the analysis of responses from a consultation the Department had on key issues relating to the Bill. When, Mr. when Minister Hargey briefed the Committee on the 13th of May on the need for accelerated passage, I don't believe it would have changed the Committee's view, but it was an oversight that should not have happened, and that has been accepted. I'm glad to inform the House that, as per Minister McKillen's comments, given in this House, the Committee was briefed last week on this matter by a senior departmental official. The committee accepted that the cause of this oversight was no more than human error and was reassured that the department is reviewing its procedures to ensure it doesn't happen again. And I'd like to thank the minister for taking the issue so seriously and getting it resolved quite quickly. The urgent need to reclassify registered housing associations is clear. These housing associations are the cornerstone of our social housing development programme. To be classified as public bodies renders their ability to raise private funds to build homes an impossible task. So there is a real tangible impact on these organisations as a result of how they are classified by ONS. It is the case that ONS decision has prevented the executive accessing funding through financial transactions capital, a government loan scheme which is used to support the housing co-ownership scheme. Clearly this has significantly impacts the funding of Northern Ireland Co-ownership Housing Association and reduces the opportunity for people to get a foot on the property ladder. Maintaining this funding is costing the Department £3 million per month. That is money that can be spent on a range of other priorities, and any further delays means other important issues are denied that funding. The Committee accepted the Department's position that the Bill had to be passed before the summer recess to reduce any further costs to the Department. The Committee was informed that ONS will review the Housing Amendment Bill once it's received royal assent, so the sooner that is achieved, the sooner ONS can reverse its decision. Reg registered housing associations will then have the confidence to plan their housing programmes and to access financial transaction capital, and that can be restored. In a time of uncertainty, the more certainty that this Assembly can give, the better. Temporary Speaker, I will conclude where this process began with the request for this bill to proceed via accelerated passage. No committee is ever entirely happy with the use of accelerated passage, and the reasons to support it have to be important enough for the committee to agree to set aside its statutory scrutiny rule. In this case, the committee agreed the reasons were that important, and the financial and wider societal issues warranted supporting the Minister's request. Today, we are glad to see the bill reach its final stage, we look forward to re receiving royal assent and hearing hopefully soon after that that the ONS has reversed its decision. And as an Alliance representative on the committee, I would just like to thank the Minister for taking this forward so quickly. There are issues that we need to be dealing with with the Housing Executive, but given the fact that today we heard from the Finance Minister how much money is handed back because we cannot access the financial transactions capital, it is right and proper that we process this as quickly as possible. Thank you. I call upon Sinead Ennis. Ms Ennis. Gura Moigat, Can Corlea. Listen, I'm not going to rehash the, the many arguments in support of this bill that have been made over the last number of weeks, um, but I do want to reiterate my praise uh, for both Minister Hargey and Minister um, Nicolin to uh, in their determination to achieve the re reclassification of the housing associations. Um, we know the knock-on detrimental effect of not achieving reclassification. Um, it has been well articulated by members across this chamber um, in the last number of weeks, and not least of all the effect it would have on the ability to build much-needed um, social homes, which would see this, this drop by 50 per cent in real terms. And I know that's something that none of us in this chamber could stand over. 
Um, I think it would be useful. Um, sorry, I think it was useful for uh, the committee to have received clarity from the department um, officials last week uh, on the ONS reclassification and why the housing executive could not be included in this bill. Um, and it was also very encouraging to hear uh, officials reiterate um, Minister Hargey's commitment to bring forward proposals around uh, the housing executive sales scheme. Um, and, and that, would, that would give the committee proper time uh, for scrutiny, which is what we, we were all asking for. And I'm glad to hear Minister um, Nicole re, uh, reiter, reiterate um, her support for that course of action here today. Uh, new decade, new approach um, brings a focus on building homes um, in areas where objective need has been identified. Um, and Sinn Féin believe adequate housing is a human right, and we will continue to promote this across the island. The unacceptable level of homeless, homelessness north and south needs to be addressed, and we are certainly up for doing that. Sinn Féin believe that the building of social and affordable homes should be targeted in areas of highest need, and rural areas need to be included and should not be forgotten about in this respect. As an MLA representing a largely rural constituency, I know that housing development in rural locations has missed its target over each of the last five years. The housing executives' rural and place shaping teams need to work with rural communities and their representatives to examine their housing needs and support housing associations in the delivery of new build schemes to address social um, housing need in areas such as South Down. This bill is about maintaining the support and supply of new homes, which is necessary to help families and people to access housing and have the security and dignity of a home. This assembly must ensure maximum delivery of social and affordable homes, and this will undoubtedly be achieved by the passage of, of this bill, and Sinn Féin will be supporting the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Innes. And the next speaker uh, is Mr Mark H. Durkin. Thank you, Mr Temporary Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise in support of the bill. The Minister and other speakers have outlined the necessity of this bill and the undoubted benefits that it does bring in terms of enabling our housing associations to access more funding and build more much-needed homes as our housing waiting lists continue to spiral and more and more families face housing stress and homelessness. We must take every step within our power to address this shameful situation and afford our people the fundamental right of a roof over their heads. Not only will this bill allow us to build more social housing, it will also free up finance to support co-ownership, allowing some people an affordable housing option, a chance to get on the property ladder, and I welcome the Minister's recent announcement in that regard. And while I do support this bill, and always have, I do regret that my amendments at consideration stage were not supported, although uh, today I have listened to uh, the Minister's explanation and do accept it, although I do still then question why the scope of the bill hadn't been wider in the first place. I'm going to touch again on the rationale that had been behind those amendments, not to try and argue for them again, but just to underline the urgent importance of bringing that other piece of work that the Minister has promised to the Assembly. Ending the mandatory right to buy in the housing executive as well as in the associations will stop us hemorrhaging over 400 homes a year from our social housing stock. For context, an answer to a written question that I received from the Minister this afternoon revealed that in the past five years we have built a paltry 5,270 new social homes. We have purchased just over 900 off the shelf and through existing satisfactory purchase and rehabilitation added around another 1,200 units, giving us a grand total of 7,411 additional social housing units in five years. In the same time, we have sold off over 2,000 units through the house sales schemes in the housing executive and the associations. This is madness. The Minister has given a commitment to bring forward a separate piece of work that we have uh, heard from her again about today to address the mess that has been made of the housing executive almost 10 years after a fundal, fundamental review into it, and I urge her to do so without delay. I welcome the ambition outlined by the Minister in a press release earlier today and commit to work with her and anyone and everyone to realise and surpass 
that ambition. We, as an Assembly, must also support the Infrastructure Minister in her attempts to secure vital funding for Northern Ireland water, because no drains means no cranes. If we don't have adequate waste and water infrastructure, our best laid plans for an ambitious social housing development programme will almost certainly go awry. Uh, I commend the Minister, or Minister Nikulain, on how she's taken on the baton from her predecessor and almost got to the finish line now. It's, it's very much in sight uh, with this bill. This bill will satisfy the ONS ONS requirements to ensure the reclassification of housing associations. It's a start. It's a foundation upon which to build and build and build. I support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Durkin. Um, I said earlier that there was unlimited time available to speakers, but I'm glad to say that none of those who have taken part so far have seized upon that to, to make a, a very long contribution. We have just two uh, speakers left, Mr. Andy Allen. Uh, and Mr. Jerry Carroll. Uh, again, whilst I would remind you it's unlimited, I am sure you will exercise restraint. Mr. Andy Allen. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Deputy Speaker. Um, and I can assure you that I will exercise constraint and, and won't speak for too long. Um, I'm sure members across the, the, the chamber will welcome that. Can I thank the Minister uh, for setting out uh, and providing the, the various updates to this House today in relation to queries at the consideration stage? Indeed, can I thank the Minister for the haste in which the Department came forward to the Committee in uh, addressing the oversight around the consultation report in respect to that. As pointed out by the Deputy Chair, I do not believe that it would have had any bearing on the decision process that we have undertaken in this House. I welcome the passage of this bill, and indeed, similarly to all members across this, this House, it is a very welcome development. It has been a development, uh, a bill that has been in the making for nearly four years. Um, housing associations will, all, of course, also welcome the, the bill uh, and the much uh, required clarity and certainty that it will bring for them. I also welcome, as the, the, my committee colleague across the way has pointed out, the uh, press release from the Minister setting out her housing programme that we received today. And indeed, uh, in that, it's entitled An Ambitious Housing Programme. And I'm sure many members around this House, and it's been alluded to by the member across the way, that it was less than ambitious pre in previous years. We have not, and it's widely recognised, been building enough houses year on year to meet the demand. There has been much talk in this House today and various other debates, uh, which I will not stray into, uh, in regard to our Assembly staff, and rightly so. Our Assembly staff, and indeed my own staff, are invaluable to me. And one area of, of uh, importance, um, not the only area, but one si significant area within my constituency office is housing. And it is indeed an area that many members, and I have heard many members speak on and spoke with other members across the House as to the many representations that they receive from constituents in relation to housing queries, not just repairs in relation to housing executive or housing associations, but predominantly the lack of social housing. And we in this House really do need to be ambitious. We need to back our words up with actions, and we need to start delivering. And I welcome the Minister's uh, announcement around uh, the, the £10 million investment in the co-ownership scheme. And that is another scheme to enable and help and support individuals into affordable housing. And I'm sure the Minister will be looking at other ways to ensure that she can maximise the uptake of the financial transactions capital. And, and indeed, my uh, party leader has pointed out today, I believe the Finance Minister has indicated that there may be FTC funding available. And I hope to see the Minister uh, lobbying the Finance Minister in respect of getting that funding and, and investing it into our housing stock. That's, that's all I'm going to say. I promise to be short, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And last, but most definitely not least, Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you very much, Mr. Temporary Speaker. This may be one of the rare times I, uh, that I am short. Members and yourself may be delighted to hear that. Um, I'm not going to speak at length. Uh, I've raised uh, issues several times throughout this, uh, these uh, various stages of uh, debates throughout the bill. Uh, just to quickly repeat my concerns uh, and to put them on, on record for the final stage. Uh, if passed, uh, this bill will restrict the powers of the Department in relation to the disposal of land and the merging uh, of housing associations. 
This bill will loosen controls, allow for deregulation, and in effect, and despite comments to the contrary, will reprivatise uh, housing associations. Uh, and going by previous debates, Mr. Temporary Speaker, uh, it's unlikely that any other members or parties will uh, support me on this, but I think it's important uh, that uh, myself and uh, other parties. Um, uh, smaller parties put on record their opposition uh, to measures that they are opposed to, uh, and I want to put on record my opposition to this bill and firmly state my concerns with it. I think housing associations should remain as public bodies and ultimately uh, be reintegrated into the housing executive. So I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. The minister uh, to uh, respond to the debate, uh, Minister Kill. Um, thank you very much, uh, temporary speaker. Um, first of all, um, I appreciate every contribution that's been made to this. I think this process, albeit under accelerated passage, has been very um, inclusive. Um, even the debates we had about our differences, most of which were done in a measured way, and I do share some of the concerns. And I think members who have spoken, but even those who haven't, and may read the Hansard will accept that from the, the last stage, the last debate, I try to get some of the queries that were raised answered um, and also try to address some of the concerns that Mark Durkin raised in his amendments. Um, I also agree we, need, we do need the, the house sale schemes, scheme and the housing executive to proceed. The difficulty is with this was they did need accelerated passage in order to meet the deadline. Um, other than that, I would have you know, assumed that this would have been taken forward just like any other bit of legislation. Um, and indeed, the less accelerated passage we use, the better, because as um, MLAs and you know, people who are looking at legislation, um, it should be the last resort rather than the first option. So I think that's been accepted. Um, and not to rehearse all the comments that people have made, but like just under 7,500 homes over five years is quite disgraceful. And that's on all our watches. That is quite disgraceful. And given the fact that there's 40,000 people on the housing waiting list, list and at least 26,000 in housing stress, that's, that's what the responsibility that we all have to step up to. Uh, I think one of the days where um, you know, I would have had difficulties, I'll admit, and previously around the co-ownership because I felt that there should have been more options and I still feel there needs to be more options. But I only know, even from my own family and my constituents, and we all get housing, that some families are paying £685 a month in rent to the private rented sector, and they're paying £328 of a mortgage under co-ownership. And when we talk about poverty, for someone who's on family working tax credit, trying to pay their rent and not getting on to the and not getting a house in North Belfast for years or West Belfast or Derry or right across, we've all got really big pressures. Um, I do think that we, we do need to be far more ambitious. So what, what I said today for me is the floor rather than the ceiling. So I do want to look at ways in which we can deliver more social housing. I want to look at surplus land. I want to work with colleagues in the executive to ensure the infrastructure is there. I also want to look at um, opportunities for people to um, you know, buy into different options to try and get this housing waiting list reduced. But this bill, in its final stage, will mean that we will meet the commitment that we all signed up to well, most of us did a new decade, new approach, um, because we could not have enabled the co-ownership scheme to thrive without the financial transactions capital that they needed. And certainly the housing associations and indeed the department would have been, more so the department would have faced penalties of three million pounds a month had this not have gone through. So once again, I thank you all for your contributions, for all the officials and everyone who brought this bill to this stage, um, and I commend the bill to the House. Thank you, members. The question is, does the Housing Amendment Bill 
do now pass. All those in favour, say aye. aye. All those against, contrary, no. All those against, say no. All those in favour, say aye. aye. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. We now move on to the next uh, motion, and that is the item in the order paper on concern and anxiety over the reopening of schools.